Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having an absolutely wonderful day. It's been a busy week for me. I'm teaching more aerial yoga classes at our studio now, and it's quite different from teaching a mat yoga class, I'm finding, so it's definitely a new challenge for me, but I'm loving it so far. Speaking of challenges, I'm not sure that I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but after we returned from Japan, I have essentially left my day job and I'm teaching more yoga and I'm doing the podcast once a week, as you might have noticed, at least for now. I also plan to make more content, work on our website, maybe try to launch course functionality on our website. So I'm pretty excited about that, though I feel that I've got a lot of work cut out for myself, but it's going to be an interesting challenge. So we'll see how that goes. All right, so back to this current episode. Today's episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co host Joe Stewart, and Leanne Davis, the current president of Yoga Australia. This is another of our episodes in partnership with Yoga Australia. And in this interview, she shares some of her background on how she discovered yoga, how she studied both Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, her thoughts on the future of yoga in this country, and much, much more. Before we get onto the conversation, though, I just wanted to let you know about what we have going on at our studio, Garden of Yoga. We have our upcoming Adrenal Healing Workshop with Gina McCauley. Joe and I love this sequence so much that we do it nearly every day. It incorporates a gentle movement practice, pranayama and meditation and only takes around 40 minutes. Gina presented this workshop for us back in May and we loved it so much we had to have her back. The last one sold out, so get in quick. It's on the 16th of November and I'll leave a link in the show notes at podcast. Dot flowartist.com. Also, don't forget about our giveaway for two copies of the book Accessible Yoga by Jivana Heyman. We'll be announcing the winner during our next episode, which will be featuring a conversation with Vajal and Jaisal from the Yoga Is Dead podcast. Exciting for so many reasons. Thank you so much to Jivana Heyman and Shambhala Publications for providing us with this awesome prize. And I'll leave links on where you can get these books in Australia and how to enter the competition in our show notes. All right, that's more than enough from me. Let's get on to the conversation with Leanne Davis. Thanks so much for speaking with us today. I hope your day's going pretty well. I was wondering if we could just start by you possibly telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. I'm a, a Sydney girl. I now live in Brisbane, but I was originally from Sydney and that was where I was first introduced to yoga, but I've been in, in Brisbane now for hmm, a very long time, way over 30 years. And so do you remember your first yoga experience and your first teacher? My first experience is not the same as my first teacher, or maybe it is. I shouldn't say that actually. Yes. So I remember being quite young in primary school still in the western suburbs of Sydney and seeing on the television Swami Sarasvati who would have a yoga session on TV. So this was in the 70s and I remember sort of coming in the room and seeing on the black and white TV and there was beautiful Swami Sarasvati who, who's still in Sydney in Kenters who she has her business there and she would wear beautiful leopard print suits and <laughs> lovely clothes <laughs> and her, her beautiful long black hair and she had Siamese cats wandering across in front of her and she'd perform yoga asana and speak about yoga and I remember just being mesmerized just thinking that is the most fantastic thing and you know thinking I want to do that you know I want to be that when I grow up or I want to know more about this so it was a really really distinctive memory that's always stayed with me just seeing seeing her and what she was doing and just something about it going yeah i I want some of that. That was interesting. And I, I was I was young. I was probably around 10-ish. And then... Sorry, did you like practice along with her or did you just yeah. kind of look at the cats? And, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both. Yeah, both. I would have watched and, yeah, tried out anything she was saying and listened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And at the, at the same time, I guess, I think that's the first thing that I can remember being really exposed to yoga and it catching my attention. But then... From that, there was a lot around in the 70s. The Beatles were doing meditation with, with Ma 
Maharishi and I think, you know, Roma Blair was around then and things. And so I'd see in the news agent and in my mum's women's magazines, they'd have things about yoga postures to do or I'd see the Beatles in their beautiful paisley suits doing exotic things. And so, you know, it was it was around. It was around us at that time. There's something a bit kind of esoteric, a bit alternative really to other things that were going on. I was fortunate. I mean, it kind of caught my interest, but there was there was around that, you know, it was there was exposure through my very early teens to yoga. And and in fact, at, at Campbelltown High School, we did yoga in our geography class when we studied India. Ah. Um, the teachers gave us uh, yoga classes as part of our study of Indian culture. And we also did yoga as a compulsory physical education session, like as a sport we were introduced to. And then we were also able to do yoga as an elective. Well, so a pretty progressive school then. Yeah, it's just it was different, you know. It was uh, Yoga was around in a kind of different way to how it is now. And, and, you know, when you think about it, I guess those school teachers who were teaching me were probably early 20s, you know, so they were kind of, you know, young, hippie <laughs> school teachers out. Maybe they were just, um... you know, so they were sort of getting into stuff that was going on as well. So, yeah, I was just really fortunate. Hey, you know, just sort of the the timing and that that exposure at that particular time when I was just developing some of my own ideas and looking out into the world and there was yoga. Got me. Was there a moment where it kind of got serious? Like you found a teacher that was a bit of a turning point in your life or you just had a transcendent experience in class and you're like, oh, I want to get deeper into this. Yeah, I think always all through my teenage years I started finding books around on Eastern philosophy and just having that that interest always you know from pretty early on I got my mum to take me to a kind of an adult yoga class around that time too probably in the first year or so of high school and so I remember that I remember going to a class like in an RSL hall or something with all the grown-ups and there was me and it was kind of candle lit and doing really classic asana poses and, and loving it. And it never went away. It's something I've always done. I guess the first time I kind of formed a relationship with a teacher is with Jaya Clark, who's still teaching here in Brisbane. And that would have been in about probably 1986 or so, I'd say. And I was going to Jaya's classes and she was teaching in the Shivananda tradition and Jaya was originally from England and she was going to go back to England for a time and you know we're all like oh you can't go what about our classes you know don't leave us and she said well why don't you take over the classes to me and Mm -hmm. and I kind of thought about that and anyway in the end she's very kindly um, said how about we go back to England via India and she and her her partner Ganesh would come with me to India to the Shivananda Ashram and and stay with me while I did a one-month teacher training there and then I'd come back to Australia and take over the classes and they would go on to England. (laughs) They must have really believed in you as a teacher to um, reroute their trip home via (laughs) India so they could support you. (laughs) Well yeah and I guess they didn't mind spending a month in the ashram either. It was part of their practice and their growth too. But yeah, it was what what a wonderful thing. I'm I'm so so fortunate, and I'm friends today with Jaya, and she she's still teaching in in Brisbane. So that that was that was the beginning of my teaching, you know. And it was a a kind of a classic thing that used to happen more often. Maybe I don't hear of it so often now. But where you know a student would be with a teacher for some time, and at some point the teacher turns around and goes, "Well, come on, you know, it's your turn now. You can't just keep." coming to classes it's time to give back or it's time for you to start passing on what you've learned and you know I'm really fortunate to have had that that guidance and that experience from Jaya and then it's probably about eight or so years after that when I started just kind of trying to continue my yoga education in some different ways and I met my next teacher Mary Kaiser who's also still teaching in Budrum here in Queensland and Mary Kaiser had been a student of Desika Cha for well, gee, even at that time many decades and so through that training and experience with Mary I became involved in the the Krishnamacharya tradition of teaching yoga and to this 
day. That's been like 23 years or so now. I continue to study with teachers in that tradition from Chennai. And so they, they were the, probably my two most influential teachers who really directed my path in yoga, my personal practice and my teaching. And so we see that you uh, also studied at the Vedanta Academy. Would you like to tell us what that was like? Well, that is the Shivananda Centre. So it was in Trivandrum. Oh. Yeah. And so they call it, I think it still is to this day, but certainly then and on my certificate, it's a, the Shivananda Yoga and Vedanta Forest Academy. <laughs> that's what it is. And that's correct, actually, because a lot of the philosophy that we were taught there is more Vedanta philosophy than yoga. We were studying the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and, yeah, very Vedanta influence philosophical basis to the, the studies there whilst we were learning more about yoga asana. So they they presented both, as many of those those kinds of lineages do. With this, the Swamis very often have experience in Vedanta and they're teaching Vedanta philosophy extensively alongside yoga. I see that you also have studied Ayurveda and Chinese medicine mm. and I'd love to find out about both of those studies individually but I'm also wondering if having through your study of both and they both see the body in slightly different ways were there any kind of differences between those two different understandings of our physiology that was a little bit of a struggle to reconcile or was it all just fitting together in layers yeah I don't I don't find them conflicting certainly not the understanding of them the the practice and application is a little bit different and that came about so throughout this whole journey really from the time I left school or definitely from by the time I was 19 I've always studied complementary medicines alongside of yoga so I think I've been consistently enrolled in some sort of natural therapies or yoga training for about 30 years <laughs> and I think <laughs> There's I have, always another course so you're like oh that's yeah what I get to next absolutely yeah. you know the more you know the more you know you don't know the more the more to yeah. understand the more questions I think I had a year off there a couple of years back, but I'm back. I'm back again studying Vedic chanting and and Sanskrit with Debbie Badger, Badger down in Melbourne. So it's still, well, you know, I can honestly say I've always been a student throughout this whole thing. So anyway, back to your question. Um, so early on, yeah, now there's lots of layers to that question, you know. So I started out. I'd had the yoga thing going, and then I didn't ever really think of that as a career path or anything it wasn't it was my personal practice and something I passed on through some teaching opportunities I mean I was traveling quite a lot in Asia and coming back to Australia and picking up bits of you know sort of massage courses and western herbalism and things and but I my my underlining interest has always been Eastern philosophy and particularly Indian philosophy but I've always been looking for ways to make it practical you know what what do you do with this understanding is always my interest. And that led me first to studying acupuncture because that was what was available around that time. So that was through the 80s and I certainly wasn't aware of any Ayurvedic training in Australia. There, there may well have been, but it hadn't crossed my path. So even though my interest was in Eastern philosophical and health systems, I could get some kind of solid qualification in, in acupuncture. So that led me to Chinese medicine. And that sat well, again, you know, many of the, you know, the holistic understanding of life and that, you know, where a microcosm that's interacting with the macrocosm and it's about keeping that balance in order. So those themes are consistent through all Eastern medicine. So I did graduate from acupuncture and was happily practicing acupuncture, or still do practice acupuncture and teach Mm -hmm. yoga. And But then the opportunities came up then. So in the 90s, there were a couple of Ayurvedic lifestyle consultant courses that came into Australia. And I was actually approached by people bringing those courses to Australia. Firstly, one that came to, to Brisbane, the organisers contacted the yoga community or the yoga teaching community because they figured we'd be the people that would be interested in some Ayurveda education. So I had that opportunity and kind of simultaneously, one of our suppliers 
suppliers for nutritional medicine in Australia launched an Ayurvedic range of products. And so they also brought an Ayurvedic doctor to Australia to take us through a few years of lifestyle consultancy courses, which included selling their products, of course. So yeah, I had an opportunity to to do two training simultaneously in Ayurveda. I was also studying Chinese herbalism at that time, practicing acupuncture and, and teaching yoga. And that was before they were formalized too. So we would just those trainings were being offered one or two weekends a month over a period of years. They didn't lead to a particularly formal recognition or anything. I guess it still isn't a registered course or anything actually in Australia to do Ayurveda, but um, the courses that I did then later develop into things where people have diplomas now and stuff, but when I did them, we didn't. But the different systems, but the fundamental thing is the same and it's consistent with all our understanding of yoga physiology, you know, of an energetic system of prana or chi you know and and again that that relationship between our internal environment and our external environment and the food we eat the thoughts we have how we conduct ourselves what we do with our body all those sorts of things so it's the same the same principle you know the language and the the treatments the application of the treatments a little bit different but they're they're compatible you know it doesn't mess with my head (laughs) I, I I get that they're saying the same thing and I guess because I've had this interest for a long time, I appreciate the understanding of, you know, energetic medicine and what they're talking about. And I think there's lots of different ways to present those models, really. When someone comes to you, do you have people who are like, I'm here to see you for acupuncture or someone's mm. like, I'm here to kind of get a private yoga practice mm. or do people just show up and say, I've been getting these terrible headaches, can mm. you help me? Like yeah. do you find you practice them separately or you weave them together in your practice? Yeah, a little a little weaving. I wouldn't say by any means I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner now at all, um, not at all. I used to do um, some of my early studies was in massage and I still massage and so I was doing a lot of Ayurvedic body treatments for a while but I I don't now and I don't say that I practice Ayurveda at all actually but mostly I find it kind of curious too but mostly just say I want to come and see you or you know people go see Leanne someone told me to come and see you can I come it's always that yeah people say I want to come and see you and I'm like okay <laughs> and <laughs> and yeah I like to yeah they people tell you about what's going on and usually it becomes very evident what what they need in terms of would you like to take some supplements this is a dietary thing you know would you like a meditation would you like to learn a chart would you you know or we get on the table and we do body work or acupuncture or lots of things yeah so lots of tools in your toolbox yeah yeah there is so it's more unusual that people ask to see me for a particular type of treatment actually which is interesting isn't it it's like people don't I don't care how you fix it just help me fix this thing (laughs) (laughs) which is good. So this this might be a little bit of a a change in topic, but how did you become involved in Yoga Australia? Yeah, watch out. People just grab you off the street. (laughs) 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 It happened to me and now I do it to people. Someone said to me the other day, like, I've seen that light in people's eyes before when you're being sized up for a volunteer job. But um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, just because I was kicking around being a yoga teacher and I think it was about 2009 when I first had a committee role and at that time we had state uh, representatives so we'd have actually three people what a luxury we'd have three people from each state to represent the state and that meant that you went to Melbourne and all the state reps came together for meetings once or twice a year and in the meantime we organised state events for the members. Um, We provide some professional development and get everyone together to network and things. So, uh, yeah, there was just people around that knew me. Those roles would turn over every three years and, yeah, people, some friends that had done it before and things or other colleagues that I had around the place just said, oh, do you want to turn at being the rep? And uh, I did. Yeah, so that was how I first started. And I'm still here. How did that, how did that lead to becoming president? Just stayed and people keep asking to do <laughs> things. <laughs> um, asking you to do bigger things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and more things. Yeah, it is. It is like that. And I loved it. I just, it's 
fun. I just had the most wonderful experience with two other teachers in Brisbane when we were the, the state reps and it was it was just such great fun and I I loved meeting other teachers and, and bringing people together and I just love the community aspect of it. Now, I was thinking today, actually, I just went for a walk and I was thinking about one of the blessings or the one of the things about having these committee roles for me that's been very important was the ability to, to meet other people by by far, that's what it's all about for me. And as complementary therapists or even yoga teachers, and certainly in my case, I've always been self-employed and for the most part worked alone, either from home or rented premise just for myself. So coming into these kind of committee roles was the first time in my work life where I really got to to work with other people and and connect with other people. So that's a, a very big part about what I find fulfilling about having a volunteer committee role and you know to this day and it is like the longer I've stayed I've had a couple of different roles I think I was state coordinator for a while and then part of the first Yoga Australia conference committee that we had and then vice president and to president and every day you learn more and more things about you know what's happening in the yoga world and with yoga broadly or the needs of teachers and you meet more people and understand things more so it's kind of felt like a kind of snowballing contribution of you know the more you're there the more knowledge of the field that you get the more you can contribute so it's just kept rolling along so far. And when did you become the president of yoga australia uh this is my fourth year so i think that's 2016 do the maths i think so 16 17 (laughs) 18 we historically have had a three-year term which just you know the volunteer role so you can leave any time but you know we try to make it that if you take a role on that you you'll stay for a while and usually then we change over but in my case I've stayed this extra year because the association migrated to a company so we had four executives committee members of the association and we all stayed on for another year in our roles as we migrated to company just to see because now we we formed a board and so the organizations run a little bit differently so we didn't think we didn't change the committee members there for a while just to keep the stability what factored into your decision to take on the role of president? Yeah, it just kind of happens. <laughs> it is true that it kind of happens. It's always, again, historically been that perhaps people come in as a state working in their states with the events and things and then perhaps start um, national management committee levels and then there's been an executive, which is your know, president, vice president, the secretary and the treasurer. And we work closely with the CEO and the office staff, the direction and the, the operations of the association. So historically, we've liked that people are coming through those kind of roles over time so that if you get to a board level or an executive level that you've been in the association for a while and kind of understand the workings of it. So that's that's really how I came to be there just from being around, you know, and having different roles and still having an interest in the association. So I guess it's like seniority or something is not the most experienced person that's able to at that time steps into the role until, you know, there's a succession then of other people that are gathering experience and can take over then. So just kind of a natural progression. It was just yeah. more time. Yeah. 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 It's work like that so far with the, yeah, just the, the history of the association that's carried on that way so far. <laughs> so it's never been a fight over the role. And <laughs> oh, no, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware. No, I don't think so. Well, it's still um, actually an elected position. Anyway, so you're nominated, so the position is elected by the members. Hello, Ron popping in just to let you know about our Patreon page. Patreon is just a way that you can help support the podcast for as little as $1 a month. Higher tiers get access to extra special content as well as listing on our website and a shout out on the podcast. 
And we also use these funds to transcribe our favourite episodes so they're accessible to the hearing impaired or anyone who would prefer to read our interviews. Speaking of which, we've just posted the transcription of our episode with Janet Lowndes. You can check that out on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. If you enjoy our conversations with these amazing teachers, we would absolutely love your support. Just go to patreon.com slash flow artist podcast. If you'd like to support in other ways, it is easy. Just share our episodes on social media or you can rate, review or subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app. It really does help. All right, that's more than enough from me. Let's get back to our conversation with Leanne Davis. And so you've really shared a lot of positive attributes of what it's like being in Yoga Australia and what it's like being the president. Have there been any challenges? Lots of challenges. I can't say there's anything I don't like. Um, challenges kind of probably for me try, trying to not to be doing it all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's uh, A, I'm very inspired and enthusiastic about the association and love working with the team of people that I do and the staff and we get, you know, lots of feedback from the members and things and you can always see you know, ways that we could improve things or help someone out or, you know, attend to things. And I, I always feel like, you know, I can, can never give enough really or that we there's always more more to do. So the challenge really is um, probably a, a time limitation for myself. It, it is a volunteer role. So, you know, we need to take care of our businesses and families and other commitments as well and just kind of moderate our enthusiasm sometimes or <laughs> that really would be the most challenging thing for me. Certainly challenges in terms of using technology in a way that I hadn't before and potentially wouldn't in my own business and I've had to learn things. And, yeah, generally other, you know, organisational things, a lot of the, the women that I work with come from business backgrounds and educational backgrounds, so they bring with them so many skills that have, I haven't been exposed to in my work as a complementary therapist and things so that's been a challenge for me in terms of not not in a um not in a negative way you know in a growth challenge you know yeah going, yeah oh you know I've, I've been just loved working with people from really different career backgrounds or different educational backgrounds and and so when decisions are, are to be made you know we come together with all these different perspectives and things and I really like that and I just I just I guess say it's a challenge because because a lot of that type of thinking has been new for me over the years mm -hmm. and it's just so wonderful to be exposed to these different sorts of things and learn. What do you feel have been your greatest successes since you've been in this role? We could kind of kind of separate that out. So I could say things that Yoga Australia has been successful in since I've been in this role because they're, they're not really, you know, they're not my successes. They're things that Yoga Australia truly operates as a team, primarily teams of volunteers supported by a really strong support of our CEO and our office staff. So anything that happens is a is a very, you know, global success from the whole organisation. But particular things that I was very interested in and kind of needed to happen when I, I came into the organisation was a broader reach nationally. It at the particular time that I came in, we had uh, a few states operating really strongly and then probably about the other four, not so strong. <laughs> so, you know, there was an initial thing in the first year I travelled quite a lot and we were very keen to, to represent members and to get out to see members and make sure that there were state committees and that there were state events going on all around Australia and that's happened and I, I'm so, so happy about that. In fact, this year we've got 49 events planned for members around the country. 26 of those have already been delivered. Yeah, I think that's a great success of the organisation over the last few years. And so as well as being in the capital cities, we have a lot more regional events, now, which, you know, and all these things were requested by members and we've been able to deliver them. So that's one thing I feel really delighted about. 
also that we included in our registration yoga therapists as a, a qualification level and a kind of postgraduate registration, which we hadn't done previously. And I think that that's very, very important. I think Yoga Australia is the peak professional body for yoga in Australia. It was crucial that anyone working in a, in a yoga profession was represented by our association. So I think that's something very, very important that happened a few years back now, 2016. So that and the other thing that we've done is really made our mark in the world actually that we've formed international partnerships and I've been able to attend events I, I also have a committee role with the International Association of Yoga Therapy in the USA and so that links Yoga Australia into a, a really strong international profile I've also joined something called the Global Consortium of Yoga Therapy where Various registering bodies for yoga therapy from all around the world meet and support each other. We moved into um, New Zealand with Yoga New Zealand. I'm about to attend the Asian Yoga Therapy Conference in, in Bali to represent Yoga Australia. We talk quite a bit to Yoga Alliance. So we've sort of made our mark and formed really fantastic partnerships and supportive relationships with other organisations around the world and uh, are certainly recognised internationally for, for the work we do and, and actually the leaders in a lot of the work that we do in our, in our educational standards and and particularly, again, this delivery of events and kind of face-to-face -face contact with our members, that's quite unique, actually, to Yoga Australia. Very proud of those things. I'm actually curious. I'm originally from New Zealand, so I'm wondering what their relationship with Yoga New Zealand is like. What does that involve? That came about, I think I was vice president, so it must be about four or five, five years ago now. Yoga Australia was approached by some training providers, yoga training providers in New Zealand, to see if we could help out in some way, either bringing the New Zealand teachers under Yoga Australia or helping them establish a separate organisation because there wasn't a kind of uh, independent yoga body in New Zealand looking after standards or registration and some of the courses wanted to have some sort of independent mark that their courses were of a particular standard because they have a very a big variety of training courses there from you know one or two days through to three years and and for the general public it was difficult to see what was the difference unless there's an independent body that's kind of registering courses so it was a request from the New Zealand yoga community that we become involved so over a couple of years we we set up Yoga New Zealand so that they had a, like a, a branch of Yoga Australia and again I was going over there quite frequently and, and working with New Zealand teachers and helping them form standards and registration and things. And just this year, the administration for Yoga New Zealand has been taken over by Exercise New Zealand, which is a great thing. So it means now all the standards and things are the same, the guidelines are the same as Yoga Australia, but it's been administrated within New Zealand now by Exercise New Zealand. And they're also developing more specific things about yoga New Zealand that apply to New Zealand that we didn't have in Australia, you know, like the integration of their Indigenous culture and the different things there that are specific to New Zealand. So We spoke to Jace Tapatu on an earlier episode. Yeah, he's doing amazing things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's such a fantastic yoga community over there. I absolutely love it. Yeah, Jace is doing great work and he's been really supportive of, of Yoga New Zealand and involved. They had their first yoga professional conference last November and there'll be another one, the Harora conference again this, this November. And yeah, they're doing great work, really wonderful community. And really, it's just really great to see them defining their yoga profession there on their own terms actually you know with their own specific cultural needs and and you know particular needs of the the population that they have there and things so they're doing really well oh, i'm glad you talked to jace that's great he's, he's amazing yeah we love we love yeah. Jace. so yeah yeah who doesn't <laughs> <laughs> that brings me on to another question what do you think yoga australia could be doing to help foster more diversity and inclusion in the yoga teaching landscape over here I think we are. <laughs> it's absolutely 
very, very, very important, um, you know, top of our thinking in, the, in the, the culture of yoga. We've made a lot of effort over the last few years to be more inclusive in our communication and, you know, even the, the images that we use, uh, the words that we use and promoting programs of inclusivity. We have been working for the last year or so on a reconciliation action plan and we have some road shows and events happening this year promoting Indigenous spirituality within yoga. So I, I feel like we're doing very well with that. I'm also very involved in generally watching what's happening throughout the world, including the yoga community on keeping up to date with our ethics and looking at misconduct conduct that's occurred in the past and doing everything we can to ensure we have really healthy yoga communities going forward that are transparent and inclusive and uh, I work with quite a few people internationally in that way that you know it's been even just this year I feel like there's been such an acceleration in the yoga community of of inclusivity and and transparency I guess I guess they're, t- they're two words that are coming to my mind on things that I'm working with every day you know you know how, how do we make sure that things are really right <laughs> and we're not just saying that they're right or we're not just saying that we abide by yoga ethics like show me <laughs> you know and and just really really looking deeply you know how do we conduct ourselves what are we promoting are we delivering what we say that we do you know there's some fantastic things happening around the world I mean as a, it's it's me too isn't it you know there's there's things happening in in all levels but I think the yoga community has really embraced a lot of areas that needed addressing through sort of cultural inclusivity all all the body image kind of stuff and addressing some issues around guru systems and sort of authoritarian teaching in yoga systems and things and it's a wonderful it's a wonderful time actually I feel very very optimistic about the health of the culture of yoga and generally actually broader society as Mm. as we go forward I think it's a wonderful time like I just keep thinking games up you know you just don't get away with stuff anymore we've got to you know we've got to look at things and we've got to listen to people listen to people that want to be heard and take seriously people's concerns and and honestly act upon things and it's been a shift and it takes well for for me I don't know maybe I'm older too so it's like challenging lots of beliefs or ideas we've had about things that we're not even aware of (laughs) that now you know we've got to start really questioning ourselves and and look at better ways of relating and of doing things and it's it's a good thing absolutely it's a really good thing yeah, and, and I feel like an important part of yoga is, is really questioning the stories we tell ourselves. So you know, I think it's really great that the yoga community and society in general is starting to deeply question a lot of things that we've once assumed. And I guess a question that we've both pondered here, and we've asked many of our guests this regards the issue of cultural appropriation when we're sharing a practice that does come from another culture. So I was just wondering if we could get your thoughts on how we honour the origins of this practice while keeping it authentic to who we are. Yeah, that's pretty much my favourite topic, I'd say. (laughs) Um, Perfect. (laughs) It's interesting for me because from when I was very young, as I said in the beginning, I saw this sort of wonderful exotic thing called yoga and, you know, started looking at Eastern philosophy and was fascinated by the East, you know, and, and have spent, you know, I think from the time I was 19, I was off by myself to Asia and have always travelled in India and and so my appreciation of yoga is very much to do with Indian culture and and history and I'm comfortable with that and my training has been quite traditional and mostly based in India so I kind of come from that but then of course you know I'm I'm a girl of the world and and here we are in our suburbs and you've got to think what do we take from this and how we deliver it in the best way for the the people that come across our paths so conveniently when we look at yoga philosophy in itself it's incredibly universal so our our thing I feel like is to to know our science you know to look at particularly the yoga sutra as our foundation which is it's not a religious text it's a very practical straightforward 
exposition on the human condition. So even while for me, I'm quite comfortable with the historical roots of yoga, but apart from that, the science stands alone and it's timeless and it's universal. And even before when we were talking about the principles of Ayurveda or Chinese medicine or these philosophical or medical systems, they are universal and they're absolutely about observations of nature. So they they very, very intelligently and are very sophisticated about documenting how nature works, how how the human mind works, how the human body works, how how we as humans interact with the other cycles of nature and the patterns that either give us balance or lead us, you know, to ill health or whatever and how do we keep that. So the principles themselves I think are really timeless and really, really universal. And if we understand them really well, I think if we have really solid yoga education, then we can see that and it actually doesn't necessarily matter where those things originated from unless you want it to matter, but we could take those principles and apply them universally. So for me, some of this comes to education about people really, really knowing their science, that we have really good yoga education about, you know, understanding the philosophical systems and the principles and the foundation that yoga is built on really well and have had those. It's an experiential science, so it's one thing to know it, but we need to experience it in ourselves. And then we're passing that on and we're, we're teaching that. And actually I come from, you know, a lot of my training's been in the Krishnamacharya tradition, tradition and Krishnamacharya himself said, you know, teach what is inside of you, not as it applies to you, but as it applies to the other. And that kind of settles it pretty well. Like, you know, we need to know, we need to have a good knowledge base of yoga, We need to have the experiential understanding of yoga and then we need to be able to use that in a way that's helpful to our our current contemporary communities wherever we are and it does translate, you know, it is applicable. So it's not so much about us, it's about sharing yoga. Yes, yeah, and the principles of yoga, you know, what's it about, what's it for, it's, you know, to, to lead us to a state of evenness of mind, you know. So how, how do we use the practices and the techniques of yoga to take people to an optimal state of mind or a more peaceful state of mind or more comfort in their body? There's, there's plenty of tools within yoga for everyone. This might be a, another bit of a change in topic, but what do you feel are the greatest challenges for yoga teachers today and how can Yoga Australia support them in that? What I hear most often from yoga teachers is the business side of things, really. I mean, that's, that's very often what people will talk to me about or approach Yoga Australia about how either to find opportunities for teaching yoga so that people are, you know, you think about it, people have had some good experiences in their practice of yoga and go on to teach a training, which takes time and money and usually do that with the intention of coming out to be able to teach themselves. So often teachers are asked about, you know, where, where can they find opportunities and many teachers want to have their own businesses in in yoga or have a significant kind of income stream from yoga, sometimes moving away from their other careers. And I think that that's a challenge. You know, people people are asking us about how, how to get themselves known as a teacher, how to retain students and all the other things about finding a venue or do I work in someone else's studio? And so that, that business of yoga comes up a lot really from teachers. We have a, a journal, the Yoga Today magazine that goes out to members and to date we've had two specific issues on the business of yoga that responds to a lot of the inquiries that, that our members have. So doing that, regular kind of bulletins and things and uh, links to partnerships that Yoga Australia has where we can support the members in their their business and webinar resources and through the, the state events we make sure that we have people coming in and doing professional development for the members on the business of yoga or how to manage social media or what they need to know about insurance and those sorts of things. I attended a great workshop with Polly McGee that was facilitated by uh, Yoga Australia and that was that was very educational and, and really fun. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, and I could honestly say those things 
come up from members' requests, you know, really when we go out and say, what would you like from us? And people, the members have said, you know, overwhelmingly that kind of business support and we've been able to provide it, which is fantastic. And, and you know, it's very well received. You know, credit to the members too. They ask for these things and we provide them and they, they do come along and support those events. It's great. Where do you see Yoga Australia in the next 10 to 20 years? That's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> or even five to ten. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a little easier. I see Yoga Australia continuing to listen to the members is the most important thing about, you know, really the, it's a membership, membership organisation and, and Yoga Australia is the members and it's some of those members being volunteers and some staff, but it's always about, you know, what does the membership want what do people why do people join you know what are they expecting for dollars that they put into a to a membership organization and stuff so we will go to the needs of the members and to where yoga evolves to which is quite interesting isn't it so I think things that I'm watching is you know where do we evolve to as a profession and it's quite complex at the moment I mean I watch on one level and you'll be aware of people wanting yoga teaching or areas of the yoga profession to go into universities or even certificate fours or whatever but having higher and higher education standards for yoga teachers and certainly with yoga therapy that we're looking at more evidence-based research to our work and higher education standards for yoga therapy so that we can work more in the in the health field so there's that kind of direction of more professionalism higher education more evidence-based, I see that moving, maybe not yoga teaching, but yoga therapy towards that sort of health modality in the same sort of way that acupuncture is. So you might do a four-year course where you learn all about yoga and yoga therapy alongside of Western sciences and it forms a kind of healing modality. So there's that movement, but at the same time, at the moment, I'm cautious about what we impose on yoga teachers because many yoga teachers work voluntarily, work in all kinds of community situations where they're not paid or not seeking payment. The average for our whole membership of like 4,000 people, we've got 9,000 people, I think, on a mailing list. The average is like three to ten, ten classes a week. So people might get anything from, what, zero to $60 per class or something. So it's not like it's a, you know, a really solid profession. So at the moment I sort of feel like we've got to keep, you know, educational standards in proportion to what a yoga teacher actually does and how many hours they work. And it could change. I mean, it could be if yoga therapy became more like a complementary medical model that there's people working in the community in a different way to how they are now. So I, you know, I see those sort of challenges ahead and it, it takes a lot of a lot of conversation and keeping an eye on things. And for Yoga Australia and, and my work and the committees I work with, that comes in the form of partnerships, you know, making sure we're talking to, I like to talk to other integrative medicine areas, complementary medicines, our partnerships with the government, with health funds, with universities and with the members themselves and just seeing where do we fit in all this where where's the best place for yoga where's the best place for the yoga teachers the yoga therapists the yoga practitioners that come along to class and just really keeping an eye on that as everything evolves so you know that's that's a bit of a watch this space I think you know and internationally the same sort of things are happening that there's a lot of people throughout the world they're very concerned about you know how to how do we make yoga accessible to everyone you know and again this this inclusivity you know we're not we we don't want to just offer this to some people (laughs) we want this to be something that all people can have and if people go and do another thousand hours and so and become yoga therapists and have specialized skills in helping people through yoga how do we make that accessible how do we make that affordable to everyone where you know where do we put these things out in our communities what kind of structure does that need for these things to be successful and i think you know that that's 
why organisations like Yoga Australia exist, isn't it? It's about, you know, representing yoga, representing the practitioners, the professionals within it and and just advocating for yoga with government or other stakeholders when when we need to. And so those those things will keep evolving. It's it's kind of new, you know, even we're still figuring out the most efficient and highly the highest standards of research that we can do in, in yoga and yoga therapy because it hasn't been done for such a long time time there's a lot of evolving things in this field and yeah it's up to to yoga australia to keep evolving and and watching and serving the members and and the communities as best we can one more question for you if you could distill everything you've learned in your life and (laughs) in your career as a yoga teacher and as president of yoga australia if you could distill everything you learn and everything you teach down to one core essence what do you think that one thing would be my goodness (laughs) oh what would it be let me think hang on take all the time you need (laughs) i think it is something about you know the the essence of yoga which is evenness of mind and it almost sounds a bit cliche really because it's i I spent a lot of time teaching the yoga sutras which is about you know yoga to reduce the fluctuations of the mind you know and then and then we see our, our spiritual capacity or an unchanging capacity otherwise we're conforming to the fluctuating you know nature of our mind and nature itself and i i think the more i teach these things the more i practice the more i see that that's that's something that you know to just hold that steady space so I think in my practice and study of yoga and and what I continue to learn having the great fortune of teaching yoga and particularly yoga philosophy it keeps you know always bringing me back to um, this sense of you know yoga talks about having an equal mind or you know the yogi can remain even-minded with the understanding that that nature will always change you know at, at any moment things fluctuate but that we have a capacity to just remain equal and I think I I kind of appreciate that that more and more it's kind of I guess like a bit of a witnessing kind of idea or or just that knowing that we do have a capacity to to navigate our life quite peacefully and to be to be kind to ourselves and compassionate to people around us if we you know we understand that what yoga says that we're part of nature things are always changing things are always evolving and that's very natural and these things go on but but we we do have a capacity of of equalness being the observer or recognizing that we can transcend the changing aspects of our our life to a point to live harmoniously with ourselves and others as best we can it's not easy (laughs) you know life's life is quite challenging but I I have a lot of confidence in in that philosophy and it probably does get easier actually with practice beautiful well, um, thank you so, so much for speaking with us. I think we've got a lot of stuff to think about there. So, yeah, it's been a wonderful conversation and thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Yeah, great to talk to you, Leanne. Thank you. Uh, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Leanne Davis. I definitely did. And if you want to hear more from Leanne, she'll be speaking at Yoga Australia's AGM. This is happening on Sunday the 10th of November and is at 11am if you're on the east coast of Australia. The AGM's happening online via Zoom, so I'll leave a link to that in the show notes on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. Alright, for our next conversation, we'll be speaking with Vajil and Jaisal from the Yoga Is Dead podcast. This podcast has taken the yoga world by storm, so I am absolutely ecstatic that we got to speak with them. There is a great and important conversation about cultural appropriation, their goals for the podcast, and how the podcast wildly exceeded their expectations. Our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Joe and I would like to honour the elders of these wisdom traditions that have been passed down to us over thousands of years and we would also like to honour the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was recorded, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. 
Thank you so much for listening. Aroha nui. Big, big love. <laughs>